Our next guest this afternoon is Phil Green, founding partner of Elsian Group, a privately owned financier and multi-strategy alternative investment manager. Phil brings over 30 years of experience across property, financial assets and infrastructure and was previously a partner of Babcock and Brown for over 24 years, culminating in his appointment as CEO upon its listing on the ASX in 2004. Elsian Group was established in 2010 and has invested over $4 billion of capital across real estate, private equity, credit and liquid strategies. Phil, it's a pleasure having you as part of our series this afternoon. To begin, Elsian has been particularly active over the past 12 months with deals in multiple markets throughout Australia from both an acquisition and disposal perspective. I think I've seen deals in Phillip Island, in Sydney, in Brisbane and in the Gold Coast to name a few. Take me through your reading on the commercial property market at the moment. Commercial property market, uh, obviously uh, cap rates are on some assets are at all time lows. Uh, with low interest rates, um, obviously, the pandemic uh, is having, I think, a, to some extent, an unknown impact on office space. Um, very positive on logistics, uh, with an acceleration towards um, uh, online retail and other technologies. Not great for CBD hotels, but as uh, state borders open in Australia, um, going to be very strong over the next couple of years, I think, for, for regional hotels uh, and accommodation. And retail uh, is continuing in its sort of, you know, attempts to deal with, with online, uh, online with a, you know, concentration, investor concentration on uh, convenience or uh, as it's now been renamed essential needs retail and, um, you know, with the, the bigger malls, etc., looking to reposition themselves. So it's a bit of an uncertain time in terms of where things go, but, you know, overall, the amount of liquidity uh, in the economy generally is, uh, is sub supporting all sectors of commercial real estate at levels which, you know, some of which are hard to, hard to uh, justify. Um, others, um, you know, if you believe the the Reserve Bank uh, still uh, look good value. And from an Elsian perspective, which sectors of the market are you actively investing in and which sectors of the market are you avoiding? The reality is we've always been opportunistic. We have uh, very flexible capital sources um, and we look at return for risk. Often been counter-cyclical investors um, well, through my whole career. So, you know, there's no particular sector. There's only uh, value for, for money um, given the view of outlook. So, you know, we, uh, we were first mortgage lenders when returns, you know, went to double digits. And that was the first time in my career that I've been a first mortgage lender, traditionally used leverage to generate returns. Uh, you know, today those returns are getting competed down. Um, still good return for risk, but they are getting competed down. For non-banks, um, you know, we can see spots of, you know, we have, we've bought empty office buildings recently um, where the price per square metre was such that we thought there were a number of alternative uses for that space. We've at times bought retail when nobody wanted it, when paid not much more than land value. Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities that come up, but it is right at this minute with all the liquidity out there, uh, not easy to find value. One of the recent investments Elsian has made is in assembly funds management run by Michael Gutman, formerly of Westfield fame, and I believe you've invested alongside assembly with the Lowy family. Talk to me about the growth of this new fund and, and where you see it going in, in the future. Closed End Fund's got a seven year life, a target uh, capital of uh, about 350 million. It's had a couple of closings. Um, we'll have one or two more before it, it closes. Um, and it's an opportunity fund that again, um, to some extent, 
invest side by side with Alcyon's traditional investors and, and has its own mandate to go out and identify, again, good value propositions. Um, you know, at the beginning of COVID, it secured a, a large format retail centre in Sunshine, which, you know, was, is now fully let and uh, with all tenants paying, paying rent when it bought it, it wasn't in that same position. So it's, it, and the, the price it purchased that reflected that. So that's been a good acquisition. It's uh, got a couple of industrial assets, bought a childcare asset. So it's a diversified portfolio with a view to building over the investment period in the first fund, you know, a strong delivering, you know, double digit returns to the investors and over a five to seven year hold period. Your business has broad exposure to property and development from both a direct investment viewpoint and also as a non-bank lender or, or capital provider. What are the major trends you're seeing in the real estate finance space? Obviously, there's been a number of new market entrants over the past five to 10 years. Has that had any impact on Elsian as a business? We've only been a, a senior lender for the last five years, so I suppose we're a new entrant in that respect. In fact, I think the whole market are relatively new entrants uh, since the banks uh, sort of reduced their exposure to particularly residential development funding about five years ago. We've always been capital partners to the development market, whether it be joint venture, mezzanine, and now senior debt. Uh, we continue to, to do that. Obviously, um, we went into senior debt because the return for risk as the banks vacated the space was just so attractive relative to being further down the capital structure. As uh, we've had five good years, but you know there are new entrants. There's big global funds coming into the space with attracted by those higher yields, but now they're here, being more aggressive in terms of pricing. But uh, you know, considering the risk, considering the alternative of leaving your money in the bank. At the moment, in cash, um, providing good returns. So, you know, uh, I think ourselves and most of our competitors are still delivering in excess of five, six percent returns on on those sort of money to to investors. And there's, you know, obviously, with the boom, particularly in residential markets, um, there's more projects to be funded. The banks, as rates come down, the you know, the banks are still probably a bit cheaper where they, where they do fund, but their uh, constraints and requirements and to some extent bureaucracy still uh, leave a good gap for the non-bank market. Alcyon also has a significant private equity division with both current and prior investments in retail brands and childcare centres, amongst other things. How has that side of the business grown and where do you see the opportunity for the private equity side of the business? I think it's in our... We're not out there competing with you know, the larger private equity firms in billion dollar deals. Our preferred ideal space is you know, enterprise values of probably 50 to 200 million. You know, we don't have a large team. So our capacity in terms of number of deals, we, we don't have a fund, a blind fund. We work on a deal by deal basis. Um, and that's how we've built the ASEAN business across all, all sectors. Although we do have a debt, a senior debt fund now. But, you know, again, it's return for risk if we see the right position. Obviously, we have a bit of a profile in retail because one of our investments is a strategic holding in Mosaic Brands, which is a publicly listed vehicle, which we did initially try to privatise, but we were blocked and kept it listed and have gradually I uh, rolled up some other businesses and diluted over time. That was impacted by COVID last year. We have another retail investment in a sort of discount variety, cheap of chips, but retail's not a particular specialty. They were just opportunistic um, acquisitions. Uh, we've also been in engineering businesses, childcare, although that's still playing out. Yeah, we're, we're a little agnostic to to the industry, um, uh, if we think the management, we've got the right management team to support already in the business or 
we can bring in the right management team and uh, get a good return on, on investment. Have the events of the past 12 months had any material impact on your investment methodology at all? Uh, initially, uh, yes. Uh, we were, I think, as surprised as, as many that, um, that the sort of post-COVID financial world has been as buoyant uh, and as strong as it has been. Um, when you look back and you look at the reasons why, they're sort of understandable from, from the date that you know, central banks around the world just threw liquidity at the markets, um, followed up by uh, a fiscal stimulus. Um, in Australia's case, you add to that expats coming home, Australians not able to travel and therefore spending money in the domestic economy. But foreseeing that in March, April last year was not that easy. But you know, having sort of actually anticipated the global reaction to the pandemic once it emerged in China and part of some of our private equity investments, particularly in retail, got us focused on supply chain issues out of China very early in the history of the virus. So we were already focused on, on the risks and issues of, of COVID uh, in December, January. Uh, and so responded, reacted very quickly when it first uh, broke out outside of China. But, you know, until we probably, we really sat on our hands for the first three or four months. And uh, it's been very much business as usual since then, but, you know, focused on the areas we thought would obviously benefit most from increased liquidity, people staying at home more, um, people not traveling, all of those things that have benefited and uh, accordingly, you know, our exposures are in residential are very focused today on house and land as opposed to high rise apartments in, you know, a range of other areas. Um, fortunately, you mentioned we sold a Phillip, an asset in Phillip Island uh, that was uh, settled literally in February last year, so we couldn't have got our timing better on that one. The federal budget was handed down a week ago today. Generally, it seems like it's been very well received, although some quarters have criticised it, just given the size of the stimulatory measures being undertaken. Do you have a view on, on the budget? Well, the programs proposed clearly you know, needed funding, whether it be aged care, disabilities, women's issues, those sorts of issues. In terms of the other stuff, it, it was already largely baked in. I don't think the deficit, I think the government will outperform. Uh, I think some of the, whether it be the iron ore price, the employment, unemployment, the level of unemployment should generate, and I'm no economist, but just looking at it wouldn't surprise me if there's, the government derives $30 billion more revenue than what's in the budget over the next 12 months. Um, that will give them a capacity to spend on uh, election promises next year, whenever that is. That is which I think is all hopefully good for the economy uh, and keeping, keeping growth going. Possibly the government could do more in terms of the ability to, uh, well, the building of like quarant a remote, more remote quarantine uh, facilities. The big challenge for Australia is going to be in, uh, in skilled labour and the education sector, if, if we can get people coming back into the country to be uh, you know, foreign students and skilled labour and have appropriate quarantining for, for those people, then I think the economy can keep going for a long time. Over your 30 years of experience, you've no doubt lived through many different economic cycles. How would you evaluate the current cycle as compared with some of the others? Well, the 80s was extremely speculative in real estate. In tech, you know, we obviously saw the, uh, the tech boom of the late 90s, which was you know, not based on, on real businesses today. I think we have an unprecedented low cost of capital for innovative ideas and disruptive businesses that make it very hard for incumbent businesses. That's probably got to a point that I've never seen. I think property cycles, we still have seen a, 
a relatively disciplined market in terms of supply versus demand, unlike the 80s. So after the sort of property recession of the early 90s, where the markets collapsed, generally the markets have been demand driven, maybe some excesses when we had all these Chinese buyers buying apartments off the plan, but you know that supply was quickly absorbed. You know, today office buildings really only built when there's tenants around. Uh, apartments are largely, or big apartment buildings are largely supported by off the plan sales. House and land is actually, in, certainly in Sydney and Melbourne, is more limited by supply than. So, uh, you know, obviously, uh, so really the big change is all this disruptive technology and the advancement in technology and how it's changing society and what we spend money on and how we live. Given your exposure and, and relationships with China through various business divisions within LCN Group, how concerned are you with the current state of the Australia-China relationship from a trade perspective? Other than you know, being supplied with uh, inventory out of China, we don't really have a in our business have a close relationship with China. We're not generally in the mining sector. Um, we're not generally in the agricultural sector. But, you know, there's no question that, you know, the uh, frostiness of the of the relationship at government levels is, is not healthy. Um, hopefully it can be uh, improved over time. The short-term signs don't look great. I don't know enough, no, well, I'm not privy to the intelligence, the defence issues that the government feel they're dealing with in terms of cyber, cyber attacks and all the other, you know, espionage and whatever else is, is concerned about on the face of it. Um, you know, I've generally would say that, you know, foreign investment's been good for this country that assets that, that foreign investors can't take with them, that are regulated, uh, where, where you know, ultimately uh, government has legislative power over those assets. I'm not sure what the risk is. I can understand with you know, some technology investments that they may be sensitive, um, but if the Chinese want to come and invade Australia and take all our assets, well then they'll do that. And if they put their money here and we still control our sovereignty, then I'm not sure what risk we we encounter if they, you know, I think Paul Keating said 30 years ago that if they can't take it with them and it, they're not digging it out of the ground and it's not disappearing, then what risk do we run? Now, I know you don't like talking about yourself, but I've just got a, a couple of questions about Phil Green, the person. Let's start with your background. You graduated from the University of New South Wales in 1978 with a Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Law degree. It's reported that you barely turned up yet mastered most, if not all, of the subjects that you participated in. Talk to me about this early period of your life and what interested you in... The barely turning up is a bit of an urban myth, but... <laughs> I did rely on a, f on a, on a lot of friends' uh, lecture notes at times. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, they were very accurate notes and I managed to, to get hold of them early enough to pass exams, but um, I did turn up, certainly for tutorials and stuff like that. And what made you choose law and, and commerce? I couldn't stand the sight of blood. What can I say? Um, it was a sort of... I was brought up in a family that was, you know, my father had a small business. I grew up in, in, a, in an environment where business and financial and political discussion dominated and so sort of commerce law. My brother, well, the brother did law. I sort of followed on that footstep a bit. When I was at university, um, the financial side, tax uh, and the financial uh, aspects of, of, of the law uh, was more appealing to me than, than any other aspect. So that's sort of you know, the path I took in my career. 
Following graduation, your first role was with Arthur Anderson, where you became a chartered accountant. We previously had Mark Corder on from Corder Mentha, who was also an alumni of Arthur Anderson, and, and he spoke of his experiences there. What were your, yours like? Well, I was fortunate that when I finished law school, the first accounting firm that sort of made a decision that they would hire combined degree people straight into their tax division without having to do a couple of years of audit. And I wanted to focus on tax, so I took a job there. It was a great training ground. They had, you know, global training structure. Um, I was mentored uh, by Alan Blakey, who uh, was a young partner that had focused on tax-based finance and was really the early father of that stream of, you know, tax advisory work, consulting work in in Australia and uh, I worked directly with him and that took me into uh, into that specialty and uh, you know the rest is history. And then in the early 1980s you joined international firm Babcock and Brown and established its Australian operations. What do you recall of this early period of the business just getting off the ground in Australia? That business was a boutique financial package or arranger that, that focused on tax-based finance and uh, I was uh, approached by Jim Babcock to set up an Australian business after structuring the first cross-border leases into Australia where you got depreciation in two countries for the same asset and uh, the first five years of Babcock and Brown were very much f focused on structured financial products that generated a lower cost of funds to the borrower and, a, uh, and an attractive after-tax return to the, to the investors. And then fast forward to the mid-2000s, Babcock & Brown was a significant business, 1,500 employees, over $1 billion in annual revenue and a market cap in excess of $8 billion. Take me through the growth of the business and in particular the divisions such as aircraft leasing which were so successful. You know, the growth of Babcock & Brown as a listed company is uh, is a matter of record. I think by 2000, you know, we were probably number two to Macquarie Bank globally in infrastructure. We had a large aircraft leasing business. That business had developed over um, 15 years before that. Started in the early 90s in a joint venture with Namura, and it built up. Today is still a still a large leasing business. Steve Zissis, the the president of BBAM, has was a Babcock and Brown partner. I'm not sure how they've been trading through uh, through COVID. They obviously would have been adversely impacted in terms of uh, uh, usage of their aircraft, but that was one of you know four key four key businesses that we had uh, at Babcock and Brown when we listed in in Australia in 2004. You became CEO of the business in 2004 after several years as a partner. Reflecting on that period now, what are your proudest achievements? The proudest achievement was, you know, that we had a, a global business that, you know, even today the, the alumni of Babcock and Brown are very successful leaders of, of global businesses. The assets that we had under management are core assets of some of the, the biggest and most successful investment firms in, in the world. Um, you only have to look at Brookfield in Australia. Obviously the most distressing aspect was that you know, when the financial crisis hit, we were way over, over leveraged into that growth and, uh, and the business didn't survive as it, in, in, its, uh, in the form that was in then. And what lessons did you learn from that period before we move on? To use leverage more prudently. On a more positive note, Elsian Group was launched in 2010. Talk to me about the gap you identified in the market and, and the origins of the business alongside Trevor and Morris. It would be uh, misleading to say we identified a gap in the business. You know, most of my success during 30 years career has been around counter-cyclical investment. The precursor to Elsian was the acquisition of uh, General Motors Acceptance Australian Mortgage Portfolio and we signed a term sheet with General Motors for the acquisition of that portfolio, I think nearly to the day that the S&P 500 uh, bottomed. 
in two thousand April two thousand and nine. They had no other, I think one other uh, buyer put their hand up to buy that portfolio and uh, raised the money from private investors that had supported Babcock and Brown's growth. We were able to secure that portfolio and it was an outstanding low risk investment. Investors did very well and that was a precursor to a couple of more deals where we bought some of the assets, uh, Orco's assets off the receiver, and then really built the business up pretty much along the lines that Babcock and Brown Australia was built up through the 90s, you know, with a heavy focus on real estate and hard assets, and just opportunistically looking at areas where we could invest capital on behalf of largely high net worth family offices uh, into uh, assets that do, or opportunities that give it delivered good return for risk. How would you describe Elsian's approach to risk and are you sensing any distress in the market at the moment? Hard to find distress in a market where base rates are zero and there's so much liquidity out there to buy pretty much anything at, at a price. So we don't see a lot of distress. There's a Again, I think you know, experience is important. We like to partner with fund people that are good delivery partners. We will do deals where we like the site where we can add value or cover any gaps, but you know, we want to be paid for, paid for that IP and we want to be paid, uh, paid for risk. But you know, again, we... Uh, we're happy to participate uh, in the capital structure at any level, provided we're getting appropriate return for risk. We got into, as I said earlier, we got into senior debt at a time when some of our competitors and, and institutions were offering mezzanine debt to undercapitalized uh, developers at rates that didn't make sense to us. And all of a sudden we got opportunities to be the senior lender at not much lower rate than they were providing MES, and that's proved to be a great opportunity. I expect it to last two years, so far it's lasted five. We're now out there as a joint venture partner um, to developers, a little more prudent about taking on leverage, uh, even at these low rates. That said, at these low rates, if you can get capital that at those rates are very attractive, uh, if you can invest in a way that generates profit or income. In relation to key metrics, say for example, LVRs or LTCs, have these changed much at all recently, whether it be over the last six to 18 months? We are see, starting to see more our competitors being more aggressive. In part, that's justified by the market. If you've got a project today that selling strongly, then you can afford to to be more aggressive as a lender because of our experience in, in being equity as well as a lender. You know, if, if we're getting the right returns, we, we may make a loan, but really see that we're just a joint venture partner. You know, often developers have a, a very optimistic view of the returns of a project and, you know, can sometimes uh, agree to hire pay a higher interest rate on, on debt than they should rather than give away a percentage of the profit. From a funding perspective, what types of clients do you work with and what criteria do they have to fulfil before you consider investing with them? As I said earlier, we look at their experience, we look at the site or the project, uh, determine whether we think they can deliver it or sometimes we think you know it's such a good project that with our help, they can deliver it, and uh, we go from there. Um, you know, we uh, pride ourselves on giving quick responses. Um, we still do the same amount of due diligence as anybody else, but if we're being told, if what we're being told at the outset, you know, stands up to that due diligence, then we'll deliver what we promise. I think we've got a track record second to none in that respect, and that's 
the thing we, we value most. We've seen the emergence of build to rent and multifamily here in Australia after many years of it being prevalent in places like the US and the UK. Do you have a view on build to rent? I struggle with the, with the economics, or have over time. I mean, if, if for institutional investors that uh, if you're buying an office building today at a 3% cap rate, then, you know, there's every reason to, to say that why wouldn't you buy or develop a residential building for rental if you can deliver 3% net return. Historically, though, with negative gearing, or with the deductibility of interest to private investors, which you don't have in other countries, and depreciation benefits, the ability to offset that against ordinary income, when cap rates on office buildings were 6% or, or retail or logistics or whatever, then build to rent for institutional investors didn't make any sense because you couldn't compete with investors, with the average investor. And, you know, with the investors coming back into the market now and you're seeing it, the cost of, with interest rates where they are, and if you look at the, you know, you've been reading a lot in the last few weeks about the, the bank of mum and dad. If you actually do the numbers, if you look at a, you know, middle class working parents of a young adult who've been married for 25 or 30 years, had their house pretty much paid off their mortgage, and the kids now, you know, looking to, or have moved out of home, otherwise were renting pre-COVID, paying, you know, I don't know, $700 a, a week rent, that's $35,000 a year. They can now go and buy a million dollar property if they got a $200,000 deposit and pay $16,000 in interest. So if they borrow, and let's say they've saved 50 grand, they borrow 150 from their parents, their parents can borrow at 2% on that money. Their kids can pay them 5% on the money and still be paying less in debt service on their mortgage and paying their parents more money than they do. That money in the bank and be in the property market. Where that leaves the rental market without immigration, I don't know. So getting back to the build to rent, I'm not sure that, as I said, you know, it may be great long-term investment comparative to buying office buildings at 3% cap rates, but I don't see it being a huge asset class in Australia. My final question is, you've been a noted deal maker for many years now. In your experience and over your career, what are the fundamentals to successful deal making? Decision making and trusting your judgment and making sure you put yourself in the other guy's shoes and trying to get a deal that works for everybody and making sure everybody leaves a little bit disappointed. Phil Green, pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for your time. Thank you.